Thanks, Michelle, and thanks for everyone to, um, for taking time out today to, to uh, look at what we're seeing through the last two decades of, of monitoring on farms. So two parts to the story. The first one is some general lessons from, from this monitoring on farms. And the second one is looking at this issue of what makes good monitoring. So es essentially thinking about what works and what doesn't work. Most monitoring programs fail and fail dismally and most monitoring programs waste a very large amount of public money. And there are ways to, to avoid those problems and having watched this space for nearly 30 years, there are some very important lessons that emerge from how you do and don't do things. So we'll get to that in the second part of the talk. So my research group specialises in large scale long term ecological research and monitoring. And we have a large number of staff, almost all of them are on soft money, and we focus on the science of it and what the science is telling us. And then from that, we engage a lot in communication and outreach from that work. So a lot of what's talked about now has been published or is in the process of being published. So my research team has several components to it. It has a statistical component, it has a postdoctoral and research fellow component, and then very important in the context of this particular talk are the field-based staff that work on a daily basis with farmers. And they do this four to five days a week engaging at many levels with land care groups, with farmers and farming groups. And some of us have been involved this for, in this for quite some time. Uh, you mightn't recognise who this is, but it's still the same person as standing in front of you. I've been doing this for more than 30 years. And as Billy Connolly says, I'm standing in front of you disguised as a much older man. <laughs> the importance of this in an Australian context is really important because our environments fluctuate wildly from year to year. In fact, Australia is one of the most variable environments on the planet. And to get an understanding of whether things are increasing or decreasing, you actually have to measure them through time. Cross-sectional information often gives you very misleading results. And there's a certain possum in a certain part of Victoria which has uh, some misinformation around it because it's cross-sectional thinking rather than longitudinal. We'll come back to that in a moment. So many years ago in a planet on a, in a galaxy far, far away, this person in the middle was the environment minister. And this was 1996. And what I've done is cropped this photograph because standing around us is a series of minders who were telling us that everything is known about restoration. All you have to do is you scientists get out of the effing way, their words, not mine, and all we need to do is stick the trees in the ground and we'll all live happily ever after. I kid you not, that's the story. It's in my diary from 1996, that discussion. We have discovered, unfortunately, that the multi-billion dollar NHT program probably delivered a lot less than it might have otherwise because there wasn't some science to guide the process and also the monitoring to guide what was going on. So there's actually a concept around this. It's called Brandolini's Law. And it follows from the discussions with the minders of the minister there, and that is that the amount of energy needed to refute bullshit is an order of magnitude bigger than that needed to produce it. Uh, sorry for the, for the uh, expletives here, but it's actually the case, particularly in restoration. And we have learnt many important things from this process of restoration in the last 20 years, which are an exception to what Robert Hill's minders were talking about. So as I said at the start, we specialise in large scale, long term studies. This one here has been going for 34 years, started in 1983. But the ones that are most important here, are these ones in the temperate woodland belt. And many of the lessons in a woodland context come from those large scale, long term studies. But the overall thinking about monitoring and what makes good or not so good monitoring comes from that entire suite of different projects. So the woodlands work in this temperate woodland belt, which is basically what used to be called the, the wheat sheep belt, but now it also grows a lot of canola and other crops. So these projects essentially go from northeastern Victoria through the Riverina, Gundagai to Albury, Gundagai all the way to southeast Queensland. So we're dealing with nearly a thousand sites and this work dates back to the late 1990s. And 
as part of the monitoring work, we, we actually look at quite a range of things, but not consistently for every one of these things across all the different monitoring projects. And that is an important outcome because you want your monitoring to be fit for purpose. We'll come back to that in a moment. But essentially we look at vegetation condition, we look at different groups of, of animals and plants, and we look at planted areas and remnant vegetation. And more recently we've been gathering data on financial status of farmers, and then other people are now starting to gather data on the mental health of those farmers as well, and we'll come to that at the end of the talk. But there's a very important set of synergies amongst that, which is why, in a sense, the talk was entitled Healthy Farms and Healthy Farmers, because there's a very important uh, intersection of those two things. And so we look at things at several levels here, uh, right down at the individual paddock tree level and plantings, uh, through to the, what's happening at whole farms, and then across at landscape levels. And these things are intimately interconnected. So the understanding of what happens at the very fine scales can tell you often about what's happening at the landscape level and vice versa. We'll come back to that. So this project is the first example of how you think about setting up monitoring programs. The Biodiversity Baseline Project was set up in the Western Murray area towards Deniloquin. It's rice growing country and there's significant issues with uh, remnant vegetation. So this is run largely by the Murray LLS in Western New South Wales, southwestern New South Wales. And as always, there are many aspects of support and partnership to build these big projects. The Australian Research Council, the Murray Local Land Services, uh, many land care groups, the New South Wales Environment Trust, etc. And I've even injected some of my own personal funds to make this happen. So this project started in 2006, is still going today. The key part of doing good monitoring is to think about what questions you want to ask. So this is what we call question-based monitoring. It's different from what's called surveillance monitoring. So surveillance monitoring is where you're very passive and you just look at stuff and then later on you think about, should I ask a question? And that's nearly always the most inefficient way to do monitoring and it's nearly always the best way to miss important things. When you set particular questions about what you want to find or what you want to understand, that's nearly always the most efficient way to do things. So we wanted to understand how effective were the interventions. So in this case, what's happening in the Western Murray is that farmers are being paid an incentive to do environmental works on their farm. Planting, weed control, those kinds of things. And the key issue here is not only did they do the work, which they did, but was it successful? Did you get a good outcome for having done that intervention? And what kinds of species responded to the intervention? So in the past, a lot of monitoring was how many cubic furlongs per fortnight of fencing did you put in? And the answer is yes, you put in the fences, but nobody asked, did it have an effect? And what sort of effect and why? So that's what we were trying to do here. The Murray LLS wanted to know how effective their incentive schemes were. How much were, were they getting for their money that they were paying under the incentive scheme to farmers in that region? And were the in incentive effects consistent across these different vegetation types. They're looking at four endangered woodland types in this system. And the next stage of this was to think about what we call a conceptual model of how the system might be working. So we're thinking about what might happen. So the intervention might be the direct removal of livestock, which might change bird communities because the eggs aren't being squashed by cattle as they they're walking through an area. Or it might be that the change in grazing regimes changes the vegetation, which then changes the bird communities. And we need to think about that in terms of what might happen with rainfall. It might, rainfall might trigger vegetation growth, and then that might change the bird communities. Or rainfall might mean that there's more water around and birds start to move to those areas. So this is what we call a conceptual model, a very simple one, of how the system works. So what you're then doing is you're putting the questions that you're asking against the conceptual model for the ecosystem to try to understand how the monitoring is going to tell you about what's going on. Then we have long-term sites in this study. And so what we have in this is places which are traditional production sites for grazing, sites where not long ago 
there were some incentive payments to begin to change the management. And then a long time ago, there are incentive payments made. And then there's a benchmark, which is the travelling stock reserve in the system. So there are four kinds of sites to test whether the intervention is working in this environment. So there's the four treatments in the experiment or a quasi experiment. And then we've got these interventions, fencing, grazing control, etc. And that's in these four different vegetation types. So all up we have 104 sites in what we call a farmscape to give us the background number of sites. And then we wanted to see which kinds of birds in this case were responding. Were they small birds, large birds, were they insectivor insectivorous birds, etc. And then you get a horrendogram like this from the statistical analysis of the data that's gathered over nearly 10 years. And essentially what the result is is that down here, the travelling stock reserves, we tend to have small birds, we tend to have hollow using birds and birds that eat invertebrates. And at the other end in the production sites, we tend to have large birds that eat a range of different things. And by and large, they're these things, the chooks, the birds that we're not really that concerned about, galahs, uh, various kinds of corvids like Australian ravens and little ravens. So it gives you a sense of what's actually happening in this system is that the travelling stock reserves act as the benchmarks. We get these kinds of species in the system and it tells us how we're going in terms of the biodiversity intervention from the incentive payment that's made. And you can see other changes in the system as well in terms of changing what the ground cover is between the production sites in blue, the biodiversity intervention sites through the incentive scheme in red, and then how far those red sites are starting to move towards the travelling stock reserves. So essentially what's, what's happening then is we see greater shrub cover, more, um, less bare ground, and more regeneration, which is very important in these kinds of systems in terms of the interventions. And so the intervention is effective, we can tell that from the monitoring. It changes the vegetation. The vegetation influences the birds. The intervention is working and we can predict which things are going to respond in this system in this way. It sounds quite trivial, but when you actually look across extensive data sets, you actually can't find many examples of like this, like this anywhere in Australia. So what we can't do is we can't tell ministers and other people what you actually got for the NHT program, for example, in terms of the, the outcomes. Okay, let's move to a different study, again in this farmland belt. This is the southwest slopes of New South Wales. This is one of the most extensively cleared regions in eastern and southeastern Australia. So this is the area that we're dealing with here. And a very, very large amount of money was spent in this area as part of the National Salinity Action Plan under various versions of NHT and other restoration programs over a prolonged period of time. The support from this particular set of studies has come from the LLS, a lot of land care groups, um, an organisation called Land and Water Australia, which no longer exists, the NHT, New South Wales Environment Trust, etc. This project started in 2000 and it's still going in 2017. So what we wanted to know here, remember we're thinking about what questions we want to ask to tell us about how the system's changing. So what are, the, are there scale effects? Do we see things at the farm level or the site level that we don't see at the landscape level, for example? Does remnant vegetation and replanting, does that interact? So do you get more bang for your buck if you plant a restored area near remnant vegetation or doesn't it matter? So where do you do your intervention? Where do you make your investments? And then are they actually different habitats? Are plantings and old growth different to regrowth? That's quite important because it tells you about where you might do your best investment. We know, for example, that regrowth, if you allow natural regrowth to happen, it actually costs you a tiny fraction of the amount of money that it costs to do a, a direct planting. So you, you can get a better outcome. So, from surveys based from 2000 to 2016, from a large number of sites in plantings and in old growth and in regrowth, we've got sites nested within farms. So we've got sites on farms and then farms within landscapes. And the amount of vegetation cover at the farm level and the landscape level varies. 
And I can hear people saying, oh my God, this is already hopelessly over-engineered for what we need. In fact, it's not. It's actually the minimum engineering you need to answer key questions that often LLSs want to know about how they do their interventions. And this study actually came from an LLS. So what happened in the LLS was that there was a rule, quote unquote, a policy directive that every landscape should have 30% native vegetation cover. It came from what's called threshold theory. Many LLSs looked at that and thought, oh my God, we can never do 30% cover. It's just too much, our farmers would never deal with that. Is there a threshold at 30%? These data allowed us to get at this issue and it became a really important outcome to redirect policy for the Murray LLS. So we're looking at the change in vegetation cover and the change in biodiversity to get at this 30% rule. So we can actually see through significant changes here, 3.5% doesn't sound like a lot, but we're seeing quite a, a, a dramatic increase in native vegetation cover through plantings and rethinking how people do farming. By investing in restoration, a lot of these farmers are actually now doing financially better than they were 10 or 15 years ago. We'll come to that in a moment. We wanted to track the biodiversity change associated with that. Other people are now check, tracking the financial change, but uh, we'll talk about that. So this is the relationship then between the amount of cover and the number of species in the landscape. And this is what's called the curve of diminishing returns, the law of diminishing returns. And that is that you actually get the biggest bang for your buck in terms of investing in uh, restoration down here at the very low levels of cover. So what that tells you is that you can make a difference on your farm at a relatively low level of cover and a highly significant difference. Now, some people said, well, what about the rare species? This is only for, for everything else. You see a similar kind of response for rarer species in the system. So this tells us that farmers can actually make quite a big difference to changes in bird species richness when we invest at this kind of level. So vegetation cover actually tells us a lot about what biodiversity is doing. And this occurs not only at the site level, but the farm level and the landscape level. And there is value in changing the way vegetation cover patterns are looked at, at these different scales. So there are no what we call triage landscapes. So these are landscapes that are, that are so heavily cleared you wouldn't do anything. You can make a big difference even down at this level. And this is a huge, a huge benefit for people in the land care area, thinking about what difference they may or may not what make. So there is no threshold response in this system. There's no threshold when you get to 30% below that, everything's doomed. That doesn't occur. The Environmental Stewardship Program is another project in this area, and I'm only going to do three before we move to the principles of monitoring. So this is a program called an Agri-Environment Scheme. And if we were in Europe or North America, uh, we wouldn't even be needing to define what an Agri-Environment Scheme is, because they have billions of dollars or billions of euros that are invested in agri-environment schemes every year. The only problem is they don't monitor them properly so they don't know much about what's going on. This is a very small agri-environment scheme. This is where farmers were paid to do environmental works on their farms and they entered into contracts for up to 25 years to do that intervention work. Unlike the Europeans and the North Americans, this program was engineered in a way to actually monitor it right from the start to see whether it worked. So this is our biggest and most challenging project. It's in yellow and it goes from uh, south of the ACT and down to Gundagai all the way into southeast Queensland. 158 farms to look at what's going on. So a demand from the Department of Environment, DOT, was that we monitored every farm and talked to every landowner. So this involved eight LLSs, uh, indirect funding through postdoctoral support from the ARC, a huge number of land care groups, um, some award money to support, uh, have a statistician to um, work out the way to deal with this, uh, the design for this. Started in 2008 and it's still going today. So the questions, does the environmental stewardship program change the vegetation condition? That's what people wanted to know. Does it make it any better? 
Are there impacts on different groups? Do reptiles respond differently to birds? Everyone seems fixated on birds as indicators. Are they good indicators? Are there different responses depending on what's happening in drought years versus good years? So what we're actually looking for here is an interaction. An interaction between intervention and weather. So when it rains, everything gets better. When it's dry, everything gets worse. When it rains, we're hoping that the stewardship sites will get better relative to the control sites where there's no intervention. And when it's dry, we want the stewardship sites to be less bad relative to the controls. Okay? So the only way to really get an understanding of whether stewardship is working is to have places where you do stewardship compared against places where you don't. And so that's how this was designed. It took a lot to get that through because the first response was, oh, you're going to be monitoring sites that aren't part of the stewardship program. But there's no way we could tell whether stewardship was working without the controls. And they had to be on the same farm because each farm has its own culture, whether farmer Wendy baits for foxes and farmer Bill doesn't, or farmer Bill uh, restricts the stock access to farm dams, whereas farmer Wendy has, has other ways of, of maintaining water quality. So you need to have that control at the farm level. So there's a control site on the same farm, and this is one of the largest monitoring programs of its type anywhere uh, in the world, so we're led to believe. So, a range of different groups to look at here. Not all of those groups are monitored on, on all farms. For example, we only do the ants and beetles on about 32 farms. And that's part of understanding farm productivity. Now the first thing that happened after the um, first four years was that the budget was slashed in half. We had to work out how to deal with that. And we came up with a novel rotating monitoring process. And then we report regularly with these big fat reports that we know very few people read. But um, there's a major outreach component to this, to this project to understanding what's really going on. And we could talk lots and lots about the different results. But here we have the control sites in red and the stewardship sites in blue. And for example, we see natural regeneration starting to take place in a significant way in the system. That's, this is really important to replace paddock trees and to change the way shelter belts are working, those kinds of things. And we see uh, other effects which I, we won't go into, but overstory and understory um, saplings. Many of these th many threatened species are doing very well on these stewardship sites and they do better than the matched controls both during droughts and during the wet. Our calculations are that you need about 5 to 10% of the overall budget to really understand how these programs work, but there are ways of implementing good cost efficiencies. So it now turns out that the ANU is basically the major outreach component to these, these programs. There is such high levels of churn within the various government agencies that there's an enormous loss of technical understanding of how these things work. And so the only constant in these two, the only two constant things in these processes are who does the monitoring and who are the farmers on these farms. So the stewardship program's working. We've got more natural regeneration, less bare ground and less soil erosion, fewer exotic plants, more native bird species. And one of the things that's really important in this context is that many of these farmers are showing much better anecdotal signs of better mental health. <clears throat> and in more recent times, we've just started a, a partnership with the National Institute of Mental Health to start to document what's going on. Many farmers, through their testimonies, are saying that being involved in these kinds of things actually is one of the reasons why they get up every morning to work on their land. We're also starting to see that some of these farmers are actually doing better uh, in a profit sense which is really quite a revelation. So the College of Business and Economics is now starting to look at that as well in this um, process. So there's lots of lessons from this and I won't go through them, I just touched on one or two, but there's, there's many, many dozens of really important lessons. But I wanted to shift gears to some insights for monitoring from what we've seen across all the major studies. So this is the funding nightmare. Monitoring is always always the last thing funded. 
and it's always the first thing cut. And it's almost never done. And when it's done, it's almost always done really badly. I was uh, talking to a colleague of mine recently about some enormous investments that went into desert monitoring around indigenous protected areas and rangeland grazing. There is almost nothing you can do with the data that's been gathered over the last 10 years. That is totally unethical in terms of the wastage of public funds. Then what happens is that everyone complains that there's no data to base our decisions upon because we didn't invest in monitoring or we cut the investment and we didn't continue things. So that's the monitoring nightmare. So we've spent a lot of time working on these kinds of issues. What's good monitoring? What's bad monitoring? What works? What doesn't? This was a book that was co-written with the man that discovered acid rain in the USA, Gene Likens. And Gene and I estimate that that monitoring has led to a saving of somewhere around about $100 billion in various Ford estimates in terms of changing air shed quality in the states. But we've done other, other books around this issue of how to do better biodiversity monitoring and then also monitoring from very long-term studies uh, around Australia from alpine regions through to deserts and everything in between. And then thought very deeply about some of the values of long-term studies, particularly in an Australian context. Really important, particularly in Australia. So what makes good monitoring? Good questions. So thinking about what it is that you want to find out. Did your intervention work? Was it cost effective? What species responded or didn't respond? So you need a good mo a conceptual model of what you think might happen to drive those questions. How does your system work? And what's a sensible set of questions to ask? Now, this is a dialogue between what policymakers need, what land managers want, and what scientists think is tractable. So it's a lo often a long discussion to get to that place of what are sensible questions in a collaborative sense. So the monitoring, therefore, often needs to be fit for purpose. It needs to, so the monitoring is different slightly for the stewardship program as opposed to the biodiversity baseline project. And you need a good experimental design. And this also takes some time to get right so that you can really tell if something's working or not. And it's, and it's not over engineering. For example, in the stewardship program, <coughs> excuse me, we needed to have those controls on the same farms to know whether stewardship was working or not. We didn't want to waste public money. We wanted to know whether it was working or not. So we needed those controls to make that happen. <coughs> you have to think carefully about what you monitor. This is always a really vexed issue. People say, what's a good indicator? Should I monitor the mayflies? What about the birds? Everybody always wants to measure lots of things, but what ha often happens is that monitoring programs end up monitoring lots of things badly and not many things well. And it's much better to be much more focused and say, what are the questions I'm asking? Then what is it that I need to measure to answer those questions? That's a really fundamental step because always what happens is that people say, I want to do continental monitoring. I want to know what's happening in Australia. But is that a sensible question to ask? Usually no. Usually you want to know what's happening in a given ecosystem. So it makes no sense to measure the same things in the tropical savannas of Kakadu as in the wet forests of southwest Tasmania. For example, the fire regime in the tropical savannas might be every one or two years. In, the, in those wet forests of Tasmania, it might be every 500 years. So it makes no sense to measure fire in the same way in those different systems. Often the continental perspective of what's happening to the environment will be for particular ecosystems and those ecosystems through time. Now this is a critical point because always we, wanna, we aren't try, try to understand why is the state of environment report so shit and so bad and why have we wasted so much money and then we say, oh, we're going to have a continental monitoring program. And then we can't agree about what to monitor because we don't think about the questions or the conceptual model. I'm sorry for the bad language, but I've watched this over the last 30 years. And it always falls at this juncture because we don't ask those fundamental questions.
<clears throat> Usually you will want to measure some fast variables that respond quickly. We know that that reptiles often respond very quickly, for example, to vegetation condition. We know that other things respond very slowly. So we think about fast and slow responding variables so that we can give policymakers some answers very quickly about what their intervention's doing. And we want to have some direct measures and then we want perhaps some indicators or indirect measures. Direct measures tell you directly about what your intervention's doing. My whole ARC, uh, my ARC laureate program is all about surrogates. We turned ourselves inside out thinking about that. Now the other thing that's really, really, really important here is managing the data. The data management is critical. The data management for that recent desert study was so poor, you actually can't work out what's been measured where, by whom, when, for what reason at any stage. That's again a huge waste of public money. The problem is that it can be quite expensive to get this sorted out to start with and not many people want to pay for data management. Somehow there's thinking that it'll just happen, but it doesn't. The other thing is that when you gather these data, you actually need to use the data to work out where the errors are. It's nothing worse than collecting data for 17 years and then discovering there's a big problem. That actually happened with someone that collected seal data in Victoria over the best part of two decades and discovered that they couldn't do anything with the data when they retired and they were going to write it up. That's a real outcome. So you actually need to engage in writing up the results as well once you use the data to actually really understand what's going on. And that's a really tough process, but it's really important to do. The really critical part of good monitoring are the partnerships. So scientists are really good at posing questions that might be relevant to managers. We're really good at doing that. We like to pose questions that we're interested in rather than questions that you're interested in, which might be different again from what land managers want to know. So it really is a partnership to work out what those questions should be and how you go about things and have a long set of discussions about what it is that you really want to find out. The big problem from the science perspective is the amount of churn that goes on in agencies like this one and, and Department of Environment and many others, is that each time there's churn, there's a loss of technical skill or technical understanding and you've almost got to start all over again. The other thing is that the reward system for people in agencies such as this is very different from the reward system for, us, for the scientific fraternity. The other thing that's really important here is that farmers are very, very conservative people. They, they take, it takes a long time to build trust. They like people to be the same people coming onto their farm who understand where the sites are and why they were set up. And they get upset when things change and they get upset when it's a 19 year old pimply consultant coming onto their land for the first time driving through the paddocks that they don't want driven through. So, there's, so this process of long-term trust and a lack of churn is actually really important for the farming community. Field staff are also really critical. Now I know that there's a big push at the moment to do everything remotely. The monitoring world has gone anti-people. So we're going to do everything by drones and everything by remote sensing and everything by bird call recorders. But in fact the best monitoring, when you actually do the analysis, of what makes successful monitoring, it's the people that are the critical infrastructure. And my hope is that in the next five to ten years, perhaps Australia won't be as anti-people as it's become in the last five years. And the other one that's important, obviously, is the continuity of funding. In many cases, it becomes really difficult to mothball projects when the continuity of those projects is really, really important. <clears throat> A few more things, I can see some people falling asleep, so I'll, I'll move fairly quickly. But often you have to do what's called adaptive monitoring. We actually have to change the project to respond to new problems or new questions or new, new technology. So again, some of these issues become really important in terms of the trust, the continuity of funding and the, and the critical infrastructure to understand some of these things. So in our case, we've got three permanent field-based staff. They're part of the local communities. They speak paddock speak, 
Two of them are farmers and they spend a lot of time in that communication effort, the daily commitments. And so those people haven't turned over in my team for well over a decade and they're in extensively involved not only in the management but also in the monitoring side and in the research side. And all of those three things are very clearly integrated, not separated. And project success is, is essential to that. So there's this dialogue between farmers and managers. Often we're standing back from that and acting as a conduit for those kinds of things. And there's a really serious commitment to monitoring. So I've invested a lot of my own personal funds at various stages or prize money and other things to make these big projects continue because there actually isn't very much of it to, to, that's, that's been done out there and there's not a lot of communication about the importance of why it needs to be done. So we spent a lot of time writing books to, this is one of my nighttime jobs, my daytime job is to write scientific papers, my nighttime job is to write communication things, to take the scientific me messages to a different level a, a, a different kind of communication to engage with landowners because nobody reads scientific papers. Well, I know, I know that. I spend two years writing a scientific paper, it might be read by the editor and two referees and my co-authors and that's about it. So you have to find another way to communicate. So some lessons for major programs, round about five to ten percent of your overall budget might be spent on monitoring. Now I don't think that you need to monitor every single project that you fund. In many cases within a major program, you might want to fund some example projects that give you an understanding of what's happening. Don't try and monitor everything because that will be an, an unmitigated failure. And have a, have a sense, a, con a, a context for this, that it does take time to see things change. And it does take some resources and people to do it. And when you cut the price, you cut the quality. That also comes from the meta-analyses that we've done. So the last little, little thing is something that's come from the monitoring that wasn't expected. And um, I'm not sure if we can, we'll, we'll get this little, little ditty going before we go to questions. But one of the things that's really important to, to have in this context is that there's enormous pressure on these ecosystems now. So there's, an, there's a pressure for intensification of farming. And in many cases, intensification will drive many of these farmers bankrupt because their systems are not able to be intensified much more than what they're already doing. In other cases, they can change their arrangements and with vegetation restoration, they can actually increase their production in their paddocks through offsets, through shelter belts and restoration. And I've seen many examples of that. For example, where farmers have doubled their dry sheep equivalents on their paddocks through the way that they've re-engineered re their farms. But there's a need to be very careful about how you do that. So there's a big increase in demand for production. Some people are going to need to go to low intensity farming Others will be able to boost production, but with smarter farming by the way that they re-engineer their sites. But this is a tough business. Farming is incredibly lonely, incredibly lonely. And we have seen many, many suicides in the areas that we've been working in the last two decades. Many suicides. We've seen many places where the local football team no longer has enough people to, to man that team, and the local netball team no longer has enough uh, people to play netball. And there's, there's quite, quite major issues associated with environmental sustainability, mental health sustainability and financial sustainability in these systems. And so what we're planning to do now through the Potter Foundation and the Vincent Fairfax Foundation is to start to put together our long-term data on environmental health with more recent data sets that have been gathered on financial health and data sets that have been gathered on mental health to put those together as, as a new farm initiative. So the, the, the Potter initiative actually has taken that up and so has the Vincent Fairfax Foundation. And so both of those farms will be part of the network of demonstration farms. So both of those farmers were inspired by the original Potter Farm initiative in Western Victoria. And so over the next five years, our plans are to take, uh, take that Potter Farm initiative a bit further
and bring in the mental health side, bring in the economic side.